All right. So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, like Nicole mentioned, I'm Caitlin Keller. I'm an instructional designer, which currently right now means I'm doing a lot to train faculty to teach online. Um, my background is in the learning sciences and how people learn. So I help our instructors um, redesign their courses to be a better learning experience. Right now with the pandemic, that's a lot of online learning. Um, I have a background in K-12 education. I was a chemistry and special education teacher in 10th and 11th grade for about six years before I came to WPI and I've been here for about four years now. So just a little on my background. Um, this actually emerged because Nicole found an article I had written for our graduate programs a few years ago on managing your time as an online student. So originally thinking about the working professional, but with the pandemic, so many of the same strategies are really useful for students that are not used to working from home um, and getting used to that environment and some strategies they can put in place to manage their own time. This session is then to focus on how do we support them in that process. So as they're going through their learning experiences, what are some strategies that you can do that will help um, foster their independence, but give them some structure on which to build some of those skills that'll be really useful for them, not only in their coursework this summer, but hopefully throughout the rest of their education, both in high school and um, in a, a secondary ed situation. So just some background on, on how this kind of came together. I'm going to share my screen so we can look at some slides. Uh, I'm not doing a super formal presentation, uh, anytime that you have a, a question, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on it as much as I can while we're in, a, in presentation mode, but I will get to them when I finish, if not. So feel free to use those sections as well. So I wanted to start with just kind of opening it up um, and you can type in the chat or raise your hand and I will call on people to use their microphones just so we're not talking over one another. But um, what distractions do you anticipate your students having, your children having, as they're trying to focus on their coursework while, you're, um, while they're working from home? So some of them you probably already saw in the spring term, but now, with the uh, you know college level course, it might be a little bit more intense. I see a couple coming through in chat already. Okay. So video games, browsing other websites, their phones. I think we're all guilty of that one having the kitchen nearby, work, Instagram, siblings. And I asked your students the same question last night, so we will compare answers in a second. So I think we'll see the same kind of question or same kind of responses here. These are some of the ones that the students mentioned last night. We broke them into smaller groups and they were coming up with some of the distractions that they've realized they experience. And we worked through some strategies for dealing with them. So I wanna share that information with you kind of, you know, I'm glad we did them first so that you can see where they think they're struggling already to help support them as well but I, it's almost all exactly the ones that you mentioned. So you're noticing the same things that your children are noticing. Access to online environments. So the idea of browsing other websites, having everything at their fingertips. They go to look up one thing and all of a sudden go down a rabbit hole on YouTube or something like that. Um, phones and secondary devices. So definitely their phones, but a lot of students mentioned that their computer is set up near their video game consoles uh, or ta you know they also have a tablet or things like that that are also distracting and nearby. Uh, having notifications pop up. So now they're managing you know, a WPI email, their personal email, all of the notifications from their social media going off that um, you know, we talked about some quick strategies to, to get rid of that, but they said having any of the notifications pop up were a big distraction. Um, household interruptions. So you know, their parents are working from home, they have siblings running around. 
there were multiple mentions of pets, you know, whether it's cats walking across the keyboard or dogs barking constantly, things like that. Uh, definitely some interruptions. And one of the biggest ones that came up was just the fact that it's really hard for them to control their impulses when there are more fun things to do around them. So when they're used to going to school, they have to kind of separate themselves from those fun activities for a while. They're, the temptation is not there to turn on the video console because it's not in front of them. So that's something they're really struggling with. And at their age, it's completely understandable. You know, they're still developing their prefrontal cortexes that control their impulses and decision making. So having that access and it right in front of them can be a really big um, detractor for them. They get really sucked into that very quickly. So what I did last night was I went through some strategies with them after they brainstormed. I took what they came up with and what we discussed last night and then tried to flip it so that it comes from a place of um, support from your side. So a lot of these are very similar to the suggestions I gave the students, but from a slightly different perspective. My big thing when I was teaching high school that I wanted all of my students to walk away with is that sense of independence and that they have the skills to manage themselves by the time they get to college. So I was working with 10th and 11th graders. I know a lot of your, your children are rising seniors and are going to be you know, considered adults very soon. So the more that we can give them the structure, but allow them to really be the ones making the decisions and, and build that independence in an environment where they have that safety net to fall back on on your support is kind of just the angle I took for some of this. And again, if there are other things to add to these, feel free to drop them in the, the comments and I'll share them out with the whole group. Um, or if you have any questions as I go through, feel free. Um, so one of the ones that I only mentioned briefly to students because they haven't started classes and might not be familiar yet because a lot of high school classes don't use them is looking at the syllabus. Um, almost every college course will have one. Many of them do publish it before the courses start. So if they go into Canvas now, it's likely that their professor has already posted it because um, classes started yesterday. So it should already be up. Um, has a lot of really important information. You know, there's the basic, you know, here's the structure of the course type thing. So that's really good for them to note whether they have synchronous sessions they need to attend. So they know what times those sessions are, if they can work their schedule around them. Their major due dates and big assignments, how much are those assignments worth, that kind of information will all be there. And I told them that's really their roadmap for the course. So whenever they are not sure where they are, that's the document they should be going back to to plan ahead. Um, so going over that with them sitting down, you know, highlighting those major dates can be really, really helpful. Um, creating a, a schedule, and the way I put this to students last night was a schedule with all of their activities. So I know, you know, they're stuck at home right now, might not have the baseball practice and other things um, quite yet, but thinking about scheduling beyond their coursework, you know, I know our grandparents are coming over for dinner on Friday, so I want to make sure my work is done before then. I'm, I want to go for a hike with a friend this weekend. And to actually have all of that on the calendar, from your side, they might not be aware of everything the family needs to do, whether, you know, dentist appointments, things that come up. So having a, a shared family calendar that they can refer to, so when they're doing their own planning, they're aware of other commitments that they didn't realize they had. Um, so communicating with them, you know, can we post it on the fridge? Is it a, a shared Google calendar maybe that you can add them to and give them a little bit of responsibility to be checking it to add it in when they're planning their own work schedule. Um, breaking down large assignments into smaller pieces. I know in the K-12 world, I did this for my students. In the higher ed world, this is often where we see students, particularly in the online environment, struggle. Uh, I do work with first year students in our uh, advising program. And this is a really hard one for them that they don't realize how big the assignment is and then they procrastinate and it's really overwhelming for them. So sitting down with them and looking at that syllabus and saying, well, this assignment is worth, you know, 30 or 40% of your overall grade and it's not due until the last week of class, but five weeks goes very, very fast in, in these college courses, uh, you know, especially the five week E2 term. So sitting down and saying, what can we be doing every week so that by the end of the fifth week it's complete and you're not overwhelmed so they might need some help with that kind of structure and building in some of their own deadlines I did discuss it with them last night but that is something that I think could use some intervention 
um, with an trusted adult to help them work through and, and see how you set guidelines for yourself in your own work and, and how they can mirror that. Um, another part is that they, they underestimate how long things will take. So, you know, as adults, we, we tend to be able to look at our to-do list for work and say, I know this task will only take me a few minutes, whereas this is a longer one and I need to break it up because it is really cognitively demanding. They tend to struggle with that. So helping them think through how long something's going to take. Um, for uh, a recorded video, so if the professor has recorded lecture videos, I work with professors to create a lot of those materials and the research shows that it will usually take people about 1.5 times to watch times to watch it. So if the video is 10 minutes, it'll take them 15 minutes as a student to watch it because they'll pause and take notes. They might rewind if something was confusing. Um, but having that asynchronous material, the professors are planning their course where they're expecting students to take about one and a half to two times longer to, to go through something like that. So sharing that with students that even though you have 30 minutes of video, you should be spending at least 45 minutes to an hour on that video because you should be taking notes even though you're not in a classroom where the instructor is telling you to write something down um, and just making them a little bit more aware of what the time commitment for things like that would be. That reading a textbook or an article in depth takes a little bit more time than if you're reading a novel. So, you know, what if 15 pages of a novel might only take you 15 minutes, you might want to expand that out and help them with some of that time management um, in terms of developing their study plan. Anything to add or questions on any of these bullets? I know I'm sort of flying through content here. Okay. Um, the top bullet here is one that I actually spent a decent amount of time talking with students about last night is for them to really think about what they need to be successful and then communicating that with their family unit or people that they're living with to help set some of the expectations and what supports they need. So they're advocating for themselves. And a lot of them were saying, you know, I really need a quiet place to study. So I need to be able to use my room, even if it's shared with a sibling or I know I work better with an accountability buddy. So if dad is working in the office, can I set up a space there? And if we're both really productive at the same time, I think that'll keep me focused, um, you know, things like that. So for them to realize what their own needs are, but to actually have a family conversation and work through some of that, part of that also expands into just the familial expectations. You know, most of them I'm sure have at least one parent that's been working at home for a while now and there are certain routines that have come into place especially with it being summer they might have taken on some of the helping out with wrangling siblings or taking dogs for walks in the middle of the day that if they have class now might need to be adjusted so setting some expectations of you know if they have class from 10 to noon that they need to be able to have that time where someone else is taking over those responsibilities but they can schedule time later in the day to give a parent a break or um, you know, do the other things that they need to around that. So knowing that those things are already accounted for ahead of time and then it's not a surprise or stressing anybody out in the moment. Um, I did kind of bring them back to the idea of the family calendar and really sitting down and making sure that everybody's on the same page and that everybody knows where everyone else is. So, you know, if they're going to be on calls from this amount of time that that gets put on the family calendar so people know not to disturb them. Um, and that can also bring in some other new norms of maybe putting a sign on their door when they're in a meeting that can't be disturbed, a different color or a sign, you know, if they're working independently but are trying to focus that it's okay if there's an emergency and they need to be um, interrupted for something that's not, you know, as, and, you know, not, a, it's a huge deal if they're interrupted kind of thing. So that was a, a big one. And I know that's difficult for them to lead that conversation. So that might be something that, you know, they have heard about that you can ask them like, oh, what have you thought about your needs and kind of bring it up over dinner and start that conversation with them to set some of those norms. Um, having a designated learning space is typically the best. And that gets into what I have you know, one bullet down is setting and maintaining routines. Having the same place that they go to do their work can really help with focus. 
Many of the students said that they would prefer that space to be far away from their other fun distractions, their video games and things like that. Um, some mentioned that they have a second computer for that purpose. I know that's not realistic uh, across the board, but if they can separate their gaming devices from that, you know, even if it's just, it becomes a, a little bit of a family norm where everybody puts their phone in a box in the kitchen for a couple hours in the morning so that everybody is, is learning to, you know, focus at the same time and do those kinds of things. And leading by example can be really helpful. But having a, a space that they know they can go to, that doesn't mean that it needs to be completely secluded. Some of them said that they're way more motivated by having an accountability buddy. So having a, you know, a parent or a sibling or a friend that's sitting in the same area as them helps keep them accountable to stay focused because that person is also trying to focus. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a closed off quiet area. Um, many of them will likely have some synchronous sessions where it'll be useful to have an area where they can make it quiet if necessary, but that there are options there um, based on their needs. Equipping it for success, um, and this just comes, I do have ADHD myself and I know things that distract me, making sure that they have pens and everything stocked in that area so it's not the getting up and wandering to try to find a supply and getting distracted along the way or finding something else, you know, a brother's watching a fun YouTube video and now they sat down on the couch and got um, sidetracked from what they were doing. They end up in the kitchen getting the snacks. So, you know, having those kinds of basic school supplies all in the same area, they're, they're not looking for pens, pencils, you know, paper, notebook, ruler, but even having some healthy study snacks, you know, a basket of apples next to their desk so that when they are getting, you know, antsy to get a snack, they're not going up and wandering through and looking at the fridge for 15 minutes. It's okay, I have some granola bars and bottles of water right here. It's all in this space to work, can help them from giving into the temptation if they get away from that space for a moment. Um, setting and maintaining daily and weekly routines. So I recommended to students that they actually try to keep the same um, schedule throughout the day. So Monday through Friday, that their alarm goes off at the same time, even if they don't have a synchronous class that morning. Um, that, you know, they, they try to keep what they would normally do, like if it was a school day. So I, I get up, I shower, I eat my breakfast, I get dressed, brush my teeth, and then I would be leaving for school. Now instead, I'm going to leave and sit in my learning space for an X amount of time and to actually, you know, give themselves a normal schedule of when they're going to take breaks on what they know what works for them. So if I work for an hour, I can take a 15 minute walk. You know, if I get the, if I get through all of my reading, this is the next thing on my agenda. So that they have a regular routine to go through during the day. Um, I know that there are certain things that are unpredictable, but the more that we can keep that routine if you know they have a class that meets synchronously only on Tuesdays and Thursdays to still encourage them to get up Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and use that time effectively. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be effectively in terms of doing their work. It could be that's a really good time for them to get some of that energy and um, engage with those fun activities that they do like doing and getting their fill of them in the morning so that they can focus in the afternoon. So, you know, it's not all about the schoolwork. I was really clear with students that they should be doing the fun things too, but to use them as rewards and to build them into their schedule so that it'll make their focus time more productive. Um, and then being realistic about the habits. This is one that I struggled with a lot, definitely at their age, all through college. I would procrastinate and then set the alarm and say, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and cram it all in. And I'm not a morning person, so then it was not a useful time for me and I was even further behind. That was not me being realistic with the fact that I am not going to be able to do that kind of work in the morning. And it's the same now. I have to be aware of myself. If I start meetings by 9 a.m., the first hour I wake up, I am a useless human being. So I need that hour to, you know, drink my tea, do my workout, uh, read the newspaper, whatever it is, that that'll help me set my routine. But I'm also realistic that even though that's technically a free hour in my calendar, that I'm not going to do something that's productive for my work during that time. You know, other people might find that if they're hungry, they can't work. So, you know, trying to squeeze a lot in before, right before lunch is going to be really tough if they're starting to get hungry. So being realistic with those routines is really, really important. Um, it's hard for them to recognize at that age that 
they think that they're capable of some of those things and have gotten away with it in high school classes where they might not have had to study as hard, but then realize that they've left a lot to the last minute because they thought they'd be able to pull off, you know, the all nighter or getting up really early and that's not how they actually function well. So then they, they get that kind of rude awakening. Um, so again, I, this is a lot of information really quick and I, I don't want to spend the whole time of just me talking. Um, are, I, we brought up some of the distractions you know you see with students, but if you have certain concerns that you want me to address specifically um, that you're concerned about with online learning in general and them navigating, if there are things about time management or organization, um, like I said, my background is training people on how to do online learning well, so I, I'm very familiar with Canvas and how most professors are going about organizing those courses and you know some strategies along that way I'm happy to discuss. But uh, this is to help you help them. So if there are certain things that you're concerned about or, or want more guidance on, I'm happy to help there. So again, you're welcome to use the chat or if you use the uh, raise hand function, I can call on people to unmute. Yeah, so I just saw in the chat, the distinction between required work and recommended work is really tough. It's not required, so why do it? Um, I train faculty on trying to make that um, explicit, the rationale for why they're assigning anything, even if it is required. Not all of them do it, but that's common even with graduate students. If it's not part of the grade, why bother? Um, I think, this is actually a really good time for these students because most of them have likely not experienced the college course that to realize that the, the um, recommended work is the practice for the required work in almost all of the, the cases. So doing those extra practice problems means that you've now already started studying for your test because you're doing the practice problems that are similar to the test questions, even if you don't have to hand them in. So that I think is the best way to put it is the recommended work is usually there as the practice and in college they're not going to give you the in class practice that they're used to in a high school classroom. They might have one or two practice problems throughout an entire lecture. They're not sitting and working on worksheets with people for an hour before a test. So those are those problems. Um, so I think phrasing it that way can be really helpful. Um, love to know if professors are emphasizing these types of assignments may take longer than you think to do well. Some definitely are, um, others might not be as much, but most of the professors that have um, non-matriculated students, so frontier students as well as students from other schools, are, have met with me at least a little bit or our team a little bit to try to help uh, make some of those explicit, but there is some expectation that they're going to know how much time it's going to take. Most of the course designs that we work on, I try to um, do analysis with faculty about how long they're, uh, usually in weekly chunks, will take them. A three credit course, a student should be spending around 15 hours a week on outside of class sessions. So if they have synchronous sessions, um, that would be excluding the, the synchronous sessions. So 12 to 15 hours is pretty typical. If there are no synchronous sessions, you're looking at 15 to 18 hours of work for that class. So if they look and say, oh, I only have 50 pages of reading and one set of problems, they can be aware that that is going to probably take them, you know, 10 to 15 hours, even though it doesn't look like a lot on paper. So I don't know if, if that helps for you communicating with your child, but I have, um, tried to get professors to be a little bit better about emphasizing that. How does the pacing of the Frontiers courses compare to the regular WPI course? So um, summer term is strange in general. So we have the two summer terms. We're in E2 right now, which is our second summer term that is five weeks long. 
Um, Nicole can verify for me, but I believe Frontiers is running on the same schedule this year and that we gave them the opportunity to take actual WPI courses as part of this. That's correct. They are in the WPI courses with our students and other undergrads. So they are in the yeah. E2 course. Yeah, and E2 is a little strange because we normally run on a seven week uh, schedule for normal classes, both regular term and um, our first summer term. So this is a condensed version and it is, you know, in that case, they might actually be closer to the 18 to 20 hours a week class. Um, professors aware of which students are the high school frontier students. I believe they were made aware. We were trying to put an indication on the registrar, but again, Nicole would be able to clarify. Yeah, yeah, we've been working with the professors and they know when they have students in the class that are frontiers and they have lists. Yeah, and it's courses that we're used to having um, those kinds of things during the summer, you know, the early calculus courses or early robotics courses and such. So this is a, with the online learning, this is a whole new world. Um, so I don't know what the percentages are. We have way more students taking online courses, even our regular students this year than ever before. So I think the numbers are really different this year than they've been in the past. Again, you know, Cole can um, possibly clarify that, but. Um, yeah, yes, again, this is all new <laughs> for us. So, um, you know, I, I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry, I don't have that data in front of me. Yeah. Um, but mo many of the students that are taking courses this summer are incoming freshmen who have also never taken a course. So there is a population that is new to WPI or are non-matriculated into WPI as well. Uh, but we do have more WPI students than ever taking online courses this summer. Um, they are teaching seven weeks of material in the five weeks. Um, and it is a little bit more intensive, so a normal course should feel actually a little bit easier. Um, some of the courses don't necessarily try to squeeze all of the material in, but have set it up where the way their assignments work, they might do more of a jigsaw where a student is focusing on one topic in a little bit more depth and other classmates might be focusing on other ones and they're sharing that out in presentation. So they might not be doing a deep dive into all of those topics that they might if it was a longer course. But for the most part, they are doing you know, the same amount of work, but it's a more intensive, fast experience. We only started doing the five week term either last summer or the summer before, so it's still pretty new to us. And I teach in the five week term, it, it is fast. And faculty here are really good about the um, getting feedback quickly because of that. So even in seven weeks, it goes very fast. So they, you know, we typically, if we're on campus, are meeting four to five times a week. So they do get feedback pretty quickly on most of their assignments. Yeah, so should students be accessing tutoring sessions now? It doesn't hurt to at least establish the um, connection with tutoring if that's something they think they might need. And we do have the tutoring available that can help them with breaking down some of those bigger assignments and working on some of these organizational skills. So it's not a bad idea to reach out now and the tutors can actually think about it with the students and say, oh, you know, I took this class and I know it's not in due until later, but if you wait until the end, this is what's gonna happen and can help them think about breaking it down. So I would absolutely reach out um, yeah. sooner rather than later. And if I can add to that, Caitlin, um, the, the tutoring sessions are also homework sessions too. So they don't need to feel like they need to ask for help. It can be simply a place where they can go to gather with students who are taking the same class as them, do homework assignments together um, and just gather that way. Um, and that would also, I would imagine, help keep them on track if they started doing that. And those are offered twice a day at different times. So lots of opportunity there. Yeah. Um, advice about maintaining the balance of student initiating and keeping schedule versus parent reminders and discussions. I know it's easy for us to feel like we're nagging and getting onto it. I have my 11 year old nephew's been quarantined with me, so I'm experiencing it myself. Um, I think at this point, what you can do is just 
bring it up as dinner conversation. You know, what do you have on your schedule this week for classes? And just kind of do it more casually and see what they're willing to bring up up front. Um, you know, if you see that they're not, they're saying, oh, I don't have any work, I don't have any work, or I've got it under control, and they're not giving any detail, you might want to pry a little bit more. But I think having the discussions around a family calendar and, and reminding them of those kinds of things, saying, oh, you remember that grandma and grandpa are coming over this weekend, so we're going to be a little bit busier, you know, have you planned for that? And then they can, act, you know, if they haven't, it's at least on their mind, and it's a, a more casual reminder than actually asking, did you do all your work yet? So it's giving them the opportunity to take ownership for that, but giving the support of saying, you know, we do have other things going on. Just wanted to make sure that you were aware, you know, did you see that I added this to the calendar? You know, you have a dentist appointment Tuesday. I, I know that overlaps with class. Have you talked to your professor yet? Kind of thing and kind of do it that way, I think can be a little bit helpful. Um, but it is a learning experience and this is a, a time they're in a safe and environment to fail a little. So, you know, letting them get a little behind, there are the resources that can catch him up. And this is a chance for them to learn before they actually are a college student. So it's okay. You know, I think we underestimate the power of some of those slips and failures for students. Um, feedback to share. My student had his first session with a professor scheduled for 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Instructor interactions haven't happened yet as assessment from the syllabus thinks it's not gonna be intensive as he thought. Um, yeah, it's the first week of classes, everyone with online have been starting. I know my class didn't start until today, but yesterday is technically the first day. So um, I'm not 100% sure what might be going on in that situation. I would say reach out to Nicole's team and we can check in um, on the back end and make sure that faculty are, are set up. But I, again, I don't know which course it is to know if it's not going to be nearly as intensive, but they are all um, WPI college level rigor courses. So they, there shouldn't be anything that's, you know, a really easy A or that mm. doesn't involve any sort of work. Um, for Michelle, that your students planning on reviewing the classes on the first two days of the week and working on homework. As long as that's what works with the, what the professor has scheduled. So if there are no synchronous sessions, you know, taking two days to review the, the lectures and reading materials and then actually doing the practice problems in the second half of the week is totally fine. But if they have sessions or if they have like discussion boards that they need to submit halfway through the week, they might want to readjust that. But that's actually how I approached most of my online courses. A lot of professors are setting them up as um, weekly check-in assignments so you know you have your homework due at the end of the week and you have all week to get there so however they break it up during the week is up to them so I think that's absolutely reasonable um, again Nicole can clarify I know there's some support through pre-collegiate yeah. outreach but we do also have a tutoring center I don't know um, how involved they are yeah. this summer but usually they have um, sessions that are specifically around note-taking organization and study skills right we I mean we, we don't have those in play as of yet but it, that is something I can certainly bring up and have the the tutors address I think that's a great idea yeah and I know we do have some in place for summer because we um, we tend to do a lot of remedial classes over the summer so people that are retaking, let's say, a calculus class. So I know that we do have tutoring in place for those classes for sure. Um, Joseph was just explaining that his daughter's classes have been running, which is great. Um, yeah, a lot of students do get a wake up call in a term and underestimate the rigor and pace. So it, like Kim said, it is part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. And this is a chance for them to slip a little bit and realize that it's a lot more work. You know, five weeks goes past, by fast, so I wouldn't, you know, leave it four weeks to intervene. Um, but even if the syllabus looks light, it's likely going to be more work than they anticipate just reading it because they're saying, oh, there's only one project and they're used to high school where there's something, you know, homework due almost every day. If they actually read the project description, it's likely a way more complex assignment than they realized. So that's why I say, you know, help them break down those pieces when they look at it. You know, many of them have a rubric up front attached to that assignment. And you can see there are multiple parts to it that they should be working on uh, continuously through the course.
And I also just, you know, as a side note to make you feel a little better, we have been working with almost every faculty member that is teaching online. Um, and we've had a lot of discussions about monitoring that students are engaged in the course. So your student, if they haven't responded to something, faculty are reaching out. And if it's not coming from them directly, they're talking to, you know, frontiers, they're talking to the tutoring and academic advising centers and making sure that people are in touch with that student, even if this, they haven't been. So our professors really, really care. They are looking out and they know, you know, online is new to a lot of them too. And they're afraid of students getting lost in the shuffle. So they're really, really focused on making sure if they see that someone hasn't handed something in, if they've noticed they haven't logged in in a couple of days, that they are checking in both with the student and contacting other resources to make sure that someone has heard from the student and that everything's okay. Um, when we have a normal term, um, so we're on terms rather than semesters, there are two seven week terms per semester. Um, most WPI students will take three courses during that, um, but we do have a lot of project courses that they might only be working on their project that term or they're taking two regular classes and then they have project prep, um, things like that, but usually around three courses. So our students tend to get more courses in per year than a typical um, semester system. Yeah, so if your student is the only um, Frontiers student, like I said, we did work on getting them um, like an icon on the registrar's list to faculty to see if they had students that were not um, matriculated WPI students. So they are aware that those students might need more outreach and Nicole's team has been communicating with them. So they will likely check if they, the professor has that list, will check in with Frontiers if they haven't, um, you know, they, they see a student is slipping or struggling, but they will reach out that way. And that's part of them trying to build independence in your child too. They, they're not going to run to you as parents. They're going to try to go through some other ones and make sure that other people are connecting with your child first. Um, depends how the professor is putting up videos. We have a lot of different video solutions right now for faculty. Certain ones do have data tracking where they can see if students watched them. Some of them even have embedded quiz questions within it. So that actually can be part of their grade. Um, it, it's really on a, a professor by professor basis. So I can't say overall that professors can see it. And I know some professors are using ones that have that data and don't even realize it exists. Um, if it's in their syllabus that video, watching the videos is part of their homework or participation grade, you can usually be assured that they are using that data in some way. Um, but in general, college professors are not checking those kinds of, of things. There is that expectation that students are taking responsibility for doing it and that they're going to struggle with the homework if they didn't do that first because they're often going over the practice problem or example problem in the video that will help students do the problems. I feel for those in online high school right now though they don't have the resources. Um, you know I'm I've been at WPI for four years and I was the first online specialist here so it's, it's new in our world too. There's only two of us supporting our entire faculty. So, you know, I think we're lucky and, and hopefully we're doing a great job, but it is a lot. And, you know, not having those resources in high school and the amazing things that parents have done to, to keep students going through all of this on top of working. I'm, I'm very impressed and, and grateful for the parents that are, are putting that time in for their kids' educations. Um, Nicole did mention that it is being recorded and that I believe she's emailing the link out as well as posting it on the student's Canvas site so your child could uh, share the link with you from there. Um, and the student time management workshop was recorded and students can go back and watch. We also annotated the slides with some of the suggestions that they came up with and uh, Nicole and I edited that this morning. So that version with our added notes from the discussions are included on the um, PowerPoint file itself as well. So that'll all be available. Um, I have, or if I haven't already, I will make sure I send my slides to Nicole and you're welcome to have them. Um, I will also 
drop my email address into the chat that if you do have any questions or, or looking for other resources, feel free to reach out and I can send some things your way as well. And I'm happy to, to stay on the line for another 15 minutes and answer questions, but um, if people don't have things, you know, yeah. I'm happy to, to let you loose and enjoy your night and hopefully connect with your children and see what they're learning in their sessions too. And I also just wanted to mention, I'm gonna throw in the pop email address in there. So if you have any other concerns regarding your students' courses or anything else Frontiers related, you can certainly email um, pop at wpi.edu. And I just put that in there too. And thanks everyone for coming. I hope they all have a great term and hopefully we'll see a lot of them back at WPI in the future. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Caitlin, for being here with us tonight. I think we can stop the recording. I don't think oh, yeah. anything else is coming through. <laughs> 